Welcome back to the What's Your More podcast. I'm your host, Quentin Harris, and today we're going to dive right into the Jerome Powell show as he gets back to the podium here on Wednesday. I'm recording this on Friday, so he was just there a couple days ago, and if we could cue the song up from Prince, When Doves Cry, I think that'd be a perfect tune for what's going in here because we got extremely dovish commentary. Um... Than what we've seen over the last really four or five Fed meetings. And I'll touch base on what I mean by that. But just for our audiences here, when we hear the word dove or dovish, that means it's unfavorable of easing and things are going to start reducing, especially on the interest rate side of things from the Federal Open Market Committee. Hawkish means things getting worse, if you may. So let's get into it here. The Federal Open Market Committee met this Wednesday, and the notes and the commentaries that come out, Powell takes the podium. We'll talk about some of the things he said on here. But it was pretty much in line with expectations. I had talked about that. I thought there could be a potential rate cut. I thought that as, as the time grew longer and some of the CPI readings came out, it was more of a Hail Mary than it could happen. But I have said that I thought that end of the April, May 1st meeting, that's going to be the first rate cut. And I think Powell indicated that's getting more and more closer to happening here. And so this, this was good commentary from Jerome Powell that we've seen right now that we haven't seen in the past. Let's talk a little bit about big win if you're in the real estate industry. If you were a mortgage lender, if you were a real estate agent and you've got a beer sitting by your side right now, crack it open and drink it because this could have been a lot worse than what it was. This was a win. This was something that we needed to happen because at the beginning, they talked about that they believe there'll still be three future cuts. And so we got the dot plat map. It still indicated there'd be three future cuts. There was a tremendous amount of fear that they would reduce that down to two because they thought maybe they haven't done enough yet. And the fact that Powell came out and said that they still anticipate three future rates cuts, that kind of gives us some hope, if you may, and a better glimpse as to what's going to happen May 1st and in the June meeting. So again, big win for us. And I'll go back to this. Uh, he finally got it right. Jerome Powell finally got it right. Coming to the podium, made the proper commentary that I think eased and calmed the markets. And it, you see what happened instantly after the podium. You see the bond market kind of chill out and get better. You saw the equity markets improve dramatically. This was something that uh, you could say the economy may have needed. And I'm going to get into that later on in the show here, but I think this goes in line with some of the things we've been talking about as we get into election year. You start to do some things to boost the economy heading into the election, and I think that's exactly what we're starting to see. So a couple of things he mentioned was of the, 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 the easing, the fairly soon, he used the word fairly soon easing of quantitative tightening. Now, just to explain to our audience what quantitative tightening is, is where the Fed is reducing their balance sheet each month and not buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. They're actually taking the profits of what's coming in from those instruments and using it to let the balance sheet run off. And so they tapered the balance sheet from a high of around $9 trillion, and they've got it into the $6.8 trillion range. And that's an important number, too. I want to come back to that as an indication to why we think easing is getting ready to start and tightening is getting ready to stop. One of the things that Powell said is that he was certain. Now, brace for this. He was certain that the core PCE, now remember, that's the Fed's favorite form of inflation, the core PCE is going to get to 2% fairly soon. He indicated that would happen. And so they were very confident what they're doing is working. That's a big win. Because if you recall, over the many episodes we've done, we've talked about the dual mandate from the Federal Reserve. That's the target rate of inflation on the core PC at 2% and unemployment. This is important for them. And so that's a big indicator that, hey, they're starting to believe things are working. The other thing was he noted that this was important. If you recall, we've broken down so many CPI meetings and so many PCE, I say meetings, podcasts on CPI and PCE, and we've broken down what they were. We've talked about the largest factor on that is the owner's equivalent of rent and how that has been skewed for so long because there's this major lag. I'm going to go to a, I'm going to go to a graph I have here where uh, we actually have Zillow observing the rents versus the CPI and the PCE housing coming in. And you'll see this lag. You can clearly see what Powell's talking about here is something that he's finally committing to and saying, hey, we see this as well. This is what many pundits have been jumping up and down screaming about, including us here at What's Your One More. We have been screaming this. He's noted that the rents would be coming down off these highs, thus reducing the inflation. And so what you'll see is that in this graph in the red, Zillow observed rent peaked in basically 21, high 21 around January, April, July, and then started to come down right off of that into 22 all the way into 23. But yet the CPI readings are such a lag. All they did was increase. And the PC readings, all they did was increase because there's this huge lag between what's really happening and then the readings that are coming in. And I think that that's going to play a large role in some of the future readings because if the lag catches up to some of the lulls, we're going to see that come down. Now, energy is the only question there. Would energy pop from some of the increases we've seen there? But According to Powell, he believes this lag is going to help inflation get down to that 2%. I thought that was pretty good. Now, let me start with 
while I'm excited, you can probably hear it, that this dovish commentary came out and really helped. We needed this. It helped. It wasn't like too dovish to where they said, hey, listen, we're starting rate cuts immediately. We're going to go back to easing. Like It wasn't that. It could have been that, honestly, but it wasn't anywhere near that. But as far as what we've got over the last five commentaries, this was pretty dovish and we needed that. To me, this kind of just indicated the pressure that the Federal Reserve is all in on three cuts, that two cuts really aren't on the table anymore, because that would have been a hawkish stance, and that would have really done some damage to the markets, and I think that was a big win that we got that. And it just feels like they're buying time to the next meeting because I think they've done so much as far as pausing and leading up to that. There's been so many rate hikes that they're letting this kind of, you've heard me say this before, work its way through the system. We'll see what happens here. And I think they're waiting for these new indexes to come in to solidify that, okay, inflation is coming down. And, and if you look at the Cleveland Fed, they're predicting new readings, which would show a lowering of the core PC. Everything's in line for this to happen. And the owner's equivalent of rent and the rent itself is coming in. It should level itself out and we should get some of these wins here in the PC. The big question is employment, and I'm going to get to that here in a minute because I think that's a big one here because he was asked about the labor market to the tune. This is a reporter asked him in the commentary. What if the labor market is still good? Does that matter about cutting rates? And he said, no, absolutely not. He said the labor market was good last year and the growth rate of inflation fell. So we don't need to worry about that. Hey, ding, ding, ding. We've been talking about that on the show. We don't necessarily need the labor market to get terrible in order for these rates to come down. And I think that's important because we've seen inflation come down, even though the labor market has pseudo maintained. We have seen wage growth fall a little bit. Continuing claims have gone up, but I'm going to talk about the important metric here that he's looking at here. So the important thing he mentioned here was that hey, we don't have to have a break in the labor market for us to cut rates. And I think that was a major win that we needed to hear because we continue to see these frustrating continued claims come in. And those come in every Thursday and they're either right at expectation or right below expectation. I think we've only beat it a couple times here. But that is a big thing because that's what they're looking at. And he and finally mentioned the continuing claims. Like this is what we're looking at. They come in every Thursday. If you're wondering like, hey, can I get like a sneak preview of things to come? Or can I track a little bit of what we think the Federal Reserve is going to do? Every Thursday at 8 30, the continuing claims reports come in. If those numbers beat expectations and ever get to that 300,000 range, if it gets to 300,000, that means the Fed's probably done too much and we're heading towards a recessionary labor market. And that's something they're paying attention to. And he did make note of that. And I thought that was very interesting because he hasn't done that yet. The other thing is this, there's this ideology of they don't want to see the unemployment rate go up. We know last week it went up from 3.7 to 3.9, and I'm going to get into that in just a minute here at the tail end of the show because there's some things that go with that that I want to show in a graph as well. Um, but he was asked about housing, and I thought this was important, housing and the disinflation of rent, getting back to that rent a little bit. In particular, falling, he said, hey, I'm not sure of the timing of when this is going to happen, but I know rents are going to start to retreat and come back. And so I have this scheduled on here from the Department of Commerce I want you to take a look at because – I know we're moving a million miles an hour on this show here but and going really fast, but again, getting back to PCE, which is what the Federal Reserve uses to measure inflation. They also look at CPI, but they don't give it as much credit, nearly as much credit as PCE. Housing is the largest component of the PCE. In particular, part of that is the, the owner's equivalent of rent. I want to see in this graph here, I want to show you guys how much that makes up. And you can see on the navy blue line, you'll see how much of this component is being put on that housing. And if that rent starts to correct itself, how quickly we could get to that 2% target rate. And I think that's really important here because we just really haven't been able to see that type of confirmation from Jerome Powell or the Federal Reserve. And again, I'm going to get back to this is an election year. We are only six, seven months out from the election. We're not that far. And we're starting to see some favorable comments. We're starting to see dovish comments. This is just the start. It's only going to get better from here. Barring any type of natural disaster, uh, you go to war with someone, this is all in line with what's happened over the last 20 years and the last four elections. So we're going to start seeing them pull back. This is, the, I, I believe, this pause, this is the start of the stop of quantitative tightening, and we're going to make our way into quantitative easing. I just think it's exactly where we are, and history is on our side on this one. Powell also mentioned that, hey, when looking at that balance sheet, and I'm getting back to that number where they've tapered off They've had a runoff, and they've gotten their balance sheet from $9 trillion to six point eight. Powell did mention that they wanted to keep their balance sheet basically to the rate of the GDP growth rate. And typically that number is – he didn't say this, but typically that number is 23%. Now, if you take the last GDP, the finalized number that came in last quarter, 
right now, 23% of that would be $6 trillion. Now, Powell is saying they want to keep those two things in line. We're at $6.8 trillion. We're not that far from being at that 23% to GDP growth rate. And that's really important because that also is another sign of taking the foot off the gas and the warning sign of saying, hey, listen, kind of send signals. We're prepared to start making cuts. And I think that there's other things that kind of lead to that sign as well. And here's some more getting back to the unemployment. When you see the Federal Reserve, there's 19 Fed members, voting members, if you may, and and they survey them and they talk about what's your fear of unemployment. And they have target comfort zone rates. And I got a graph in here. So our friends over at MBS Highway did a great job of putting this one together. But this unemployment chart, this is interesting because there's 17 of the 19 Federal Reserve members came out And they said, hey, listen, we want to see the unemployment rate between the following numbers. So of those 17, six members said, hey, listen, at 3.8% unemployment rate, that's when we started to think we've done too much, meaning we think we need to take our, our foot off the gas. We need to be concerned about employment, and maybe we need to start reducing rates. 11 members said 4.1 is that number. So we've got 17 of the 19 members between 3.8 and 4.1. We're at 3.9 right now. And if that needle moves up again, this is another sign. This is another smoke signal that I think the Fed is willing to pull back and get away from tightening and reduce the Fed funds rate. Here's another thing on here. So it's funny because in the past, I've talked about how people have been able to read a little bit the Federal Reserve better than maybe now. But there is a couple of people that kind of have the Fed's ear. One in particular is uh, Nick Timoros over at the Wall Street Journal. He seems to be dubbed as the Fed whisperer right now. He has more insight to the Federal Reserve than any other reporter, any other pundit, and he's called every shot pretty much from day one of this last 18, 20 months of Fed hikes and Fed pauses. And what's interesting is he wrote an article two days ago, and he said this was interesting. Inside the article, he wrote a piece on March 20th talking about there's two sides of the Federal Reserve right now. There's those who want to wait because they think inflation is still too hot. We haven't done enough to achieve it to the 2% target rate. And they feel like the economy is okay right now. And then there's a camp that wants to cut rates sooner than later because they fear the rising unemployment. And they are fearful that we'll send the United States into some sort of a recessionary cycle. And according to him, there's more people that are in the camp of wanting to cut rates than not cut rates. And that's really important because that's probably the first time we've seen any type of indication from this insider that a rate hike is on the way. So there's just a lot of things stacking up inside of this really meeting and also commentary post-meeting, plus some inside information that we're getting that we haven't seen before that's saying, hey, listen – May 1st might be the date. That April 30th, May 1st meeting, that might be the date. And so if we get any type of reduction during that time, look out. I think the mortgage market, I think the real estate market, I think the equities market, everyone's just sitting around waiting for that moment. And when it happens, ironically in May, at that point, we're six months out from the election, you might see this cycle boom and this economy take off. And it might be a temporary takeoff, but boy, look out. It looks like it's on the way. And here's the last thing I'll leave you with. Something we brought up here. This is the second longest lag in 35 years that the Federal Reserve has gone from a policy hike to just pause. So this pause that's happened from the hike, the final hike to where we are now, it's been this is the longest drought we've had in a 30 second longest drought in 35 years. The last time this happened was in June 6, all the way to September 2007. Now that was the longest. That was a, a really long time. But The last time they did anything was July 2023 to where we are today was I'm making this podcast, which is March of 2024. That's the second longest time. And we're getting closer to that, that first longest. And where I'm going with that is there it's in the making folks. Like it feels like it's right there. We're right on the cusp and all of the warning signs are there. I I guess warning signs a bad word, but all the signals are there saying, Hey, listen, the cut is coming. The cut is coming. So how does, how do I make this work from a real estate professional? Well, Obviously, we don't want to go, hey, listen, don't do any loans between now and May 1st. But what I would do is maybe manage my pipeline and understand that there might be opportunities that I couldn't handle three months ago that are going to come available now. And if I'm a real estate agent and I had customers that were like, man, we really like this house, but we can't afford the rate, we can't afford the payment. I wouldn't say reach out to them and go, hey, listen, we're going to have an absolute cut May 1st. But what I would reach out to them and say, hey, listen, if these rates fall between, let's say, May 1st, to May 30th, are you prepared to make a move? Are you prepared to put an offer in? Are you prepared to put an aggressive offer in? Because I feel that may, that could happen. And if it does happen, are you on board? Are you ready to go? Do you have your affairs in order? And I think that's really important. Same thing with people that have been sitting on the sidelines, ready to refinance and get cash out of those homes. This could be that windfall we need. 
And if you look at the rest of the year, it's only expected to be three rate cuts at a quarter apiece. We're talking three quarters of the Fed funds rate. Let it get us back into the fours. Um, that could be enough in the 10-year Treasury market to start evaporating some of that disparity that we've been talking about. And what I'm getting is it's not going to take much to get us out of these upper sixes, sevens, back down to low sixes, potentially upper fives. And this could happen and be right in time for the election. I keep saying that because 20-year history shows that's exactly what happens. So I do see a ramp up of business between May to pretty much end of September and mid-October. And everyone seems to hit the pause button between mid-October and the end of the election. And we usually have a robust December as we head into the new year. So guys, if you like what you're hearing, please share this podcast. Please five-star review this. Please leave some comments. Keep going to our YouTube channel, checking out all the graphs we'll have on them. Our producer, Charlie, put everything on there for you to see. Love the feedback you guys are giving us. That episode we do with Brian Sexton, the feedback that you guys are pumping to us, I greatly appreciate it. I promise you we'll continue to get more guests like that on the show. Till next time, we'll see you at the next episode of What's Your One More. I got one more shot, I'm gonna make it. One more chance, I'm gonna take it. I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it. I got one life to live, so I put all into it, yeah.